Good morning. My name is Morgan Hawtharth and I'm the President-Elect of RNAO. I am joined today by my colleagues, RNAO President Dr. Angela Cooper Brathwaite and our CEO Dr. Doris Grinspan. We would like to thank everyone for coming today. We appreciate your interest and dedication to covering this important nursing news related to health system reform. Today is exactly 200 years from the birth of Florence Nightingale. To commemorate this, the World Health Organization coined, it, coined this, the year of the nurse and the midwife. Nightingale, a remarkable health system reformer, would be pleased to see how Ontario's nurses continue to take up her challenge to shine the light on reforms urgently needed today. This is why we chose purposefully this date to release our groundbreaking ECHO 3.0 report, which focuses on enhancing community care for Ontarians. Two previous versions of ECHO were released, the first in 2012 and the second in 2014. ECHO 3.0 comes at a time when our health system has been severely put to the test. We are confident our comprehensive assessment of the current health system and its response to the COVID-19 pandemic will provide welcome solutions and clear direction for the enhanced transformation urgently needed. I'd like to now introduce RNAO's CEO, Dr. Doris Grinsman, to outline key highlights of the report. Okay. Oh, I had my phone in unmute. Thank you. Next slide, PG. Thank you very much. I do it. Next slide, PG. Thank you. I too would like to highlight for you um, our appreciation that you are joining us today on the 200th years of Florence Nightingale. My gosh, Miss Nightingale would be thrilled and would be proud to see nurses releasing this tremendous report, ECHO 3.0, which builds on the two previous reports with the difference. We have undergone a pandemic. ECHO 3.0 is our clarion call, call for government health system partners to address the holes and cracks in our current system by strengthening community care and anchoring the health system in primary care to meet the needs of all residents. As Morgan noted, COVID-19 has brought into sharp focus the work ahead for the system. And we are convinced that this report will be taken with the seriousness that it deserves, forward with strength, with vigor, and all the way. COVID-19 in Ontario is a tale of two pandemics. Next slide, please, PG. It's a tale of two pandemics. One is the management of spread of the disease in the general population and its containment through physical distancing, self-isolation, and hospitalization when necessary. The second tale is the growing spread in congregate settings, all related to the vulnerable populations. RNO has decried on numerous occasions throughout this pandemic, the lack of timely public health action in congregate settings overall that has been brought in sharp focus because of the devastating, devastating effects of the disease on residents of our long-term care nursing homes and retirement homes. But they're not the, one, the only ones that have suffered. They're the ones that have suffered the most. We also have shelters. We also have people in other congregate settings, supportive housing, with much of a similar, the second tale of the story. RNO remains gravely concerned about our seniors and indeed all other vulnerable populations, including persons experiencing homelessness and living in shelters, persons living in supportive housing, persons housed in correctional facilities, and our indigenous sisters and brothers. Because of the many flaws in the system where sectors are siloed, 
and quite frankly, sidelined. We have been too slow to protect our communities. These communities need our attention now more than ever before. These communities are communities where we're extending histories and reconfirming past neglects. It cannot go on and on and on in this way. And let me be clear, this is not an issue only of this government. This is an issue of this government, past government, past government, and the time of change is now. Ontario Health, the province's lead health agency, has said its focus is to enable the delivery of better quality health care to every Ontarian while offering the best possible experience at every step of our journey. RNO shares very much this lofty goal. And to achieve it, Ontario must recalibrate its heavy focus on hospital care with much needed and strengthened community care. This is where ECHO 3.0 offers clear solutions and directions for urgent change. And let me repeat, urgent change is what we need. The report was first conceived in early 2019. Little did we know that COVID will come to visit. This was when the Ontario government announced plans to reshape the health system. That announcement renewed RNO's hope that reform would focus once and for all on enhancing community care. The idea of Ontario health teams, now referred to as OATS or OHTs, had many of the elements, including in the earlier version of ECHO. Therefore, we were sure we are going to have a system that focuses more and more on community care and that becomes more and more anchored in primary care. Nonetheless, during COVID-19, we saw what happened and the tales of two stories is the result. Therefore, in ECHO 3.0, we specifically adapt our model to change and align with the creation of a single health system administrator, Ontario Health, and the multiple integrated care delivery organizations, OHTs. As we carefully examine, examine the aftermath of COVID-19 and prepare likely for a second, hopefully shorter, smaller, more focused wave of COVID, second and perhaps even third, we must frankly address our health system performance by examining absolutely sector by sector successes, failures, experiences, and yes, outcomes. We owe it to the almost 1,700 lives lost in Ontario, including eight healthcare workers, their loved ones, and to so many who sacrificed along the way to draw from lessons learned and more even important, all everyone that has given so much by staying at home, by listening to what we need to do. So to the lives lost and to those lives that are here, we owe it to move with resolve to create a better and safer health system for all. I would like to now turn things over to Dr. Angela Cooper Brathway, RNAO's president to provide further details on the 13 specific recommendations that characterize ECHO. Nine of those are system recommendations, four are transitional recommendations that will lead us from where we are to where we ought to be. Dr. Cooper Brathway. Our recommendations with you. I will now take you through the nine system re recommendations. Recommendation one, 
expand the reach and the access to primary care for all Ontarians which are linked to a primary care system. It requires four main actions and they are build relationships between primary care teams and community members, incorporate the equity tools in planning and evaluating services, remove barriers to primary care and extend primary care services into atypical settings such as shelters and on the streets. Recommendation two, which is the upstream approach, establish approaches to care that are person-centered, incorporate health promotion, disease prevention, and integrate equity and community engagement. Three actions are required to achieve this recommendation. Incorporate person-centered care across the healthcare system, leverage the expertise of public health to inspire and inform population health and accountability. Fund primary care models based on the implementation of primary care approaches, inclusive of upstream thinking or upstream approaches such as social and environmental determinants of health. Recommendation three, ensure all primary care is provided through an interprofessional team-based model. And this requires four actions. One, expand the interprofessional team-based models of primary care through increased patient enrollment across existing models of new sites where there is a need. Place a monetarium on new independent practice models of primary care. Connect an existing primary care providers to interprofessional teams. The next recommendation is number four, make comprehensive care coordination services across the continuum of care. Four required actions are needed to accomplish this goal. Locate the care to coordinate function in primary care. Transition all RN care coordinators currently employed by the Ontario Health, which was previously the local health integration networks to interprofessional primary care teams. Expand the care coordination role to provide comprehensive and consistent care and services to all Ontarians. And support the work necessary to determine appropriate care coordination caseloads to reach all Ontarians. The next Recommendation five reads, enhance community care across the continuum, expand the reach of and the access of primary care to ensure all Ontarians are linked with primary care teams. This requires seven different actions. Augment the capacity of primary care to address mental health and addiction. Invest in improving the availability and quality of community-based mental health and addiction services. Ensure a robust home and community care services. Transition the responsibility for home care services directly to home care agencies. Reform the home care funding model from a pre-visit basis to funding basket to allow a person-centered approach that encompasses a range of nursing interventions, including health promotion, ensuring continuity of care and community of caregiver. Ensure home care contracts are awarded to providers that are able to deliver a broad range of services around the clock, so to avoid fragmentation of care. In Optimize health, the health system to better connect people to the range of social services necessary for health and well being. I'll now move to recommendation six for long term care home. Reimagine long term care 
as homes to residents and integrate nursing and retirement homes into enhanced community care pl plans and funding. This requires five different actions. Require that all the Ontario health teams incorporate long-term care as part of their team configuration, such that all the long-term care facilities are actively connected to the full health system. Incorporate a focus of the person first philosophy, planning care and services according to the individual needs and wishes rather than those of the medical care model. Modernize the function, sorry, modernize the funding formula in long-term care immediately to account for complexity of care. Modernize the staffing in nursing homes immediately. Develop new and renovated home, homes for people with dementia with special consideration to smaller conjugates of up to seven and residents per home with the design based on residents' preferences. I'd like to move now to recommendation seven. Demonstrate a commitment to enhance based practice across the healthcare system. And there are four actions required to achieve this recommendation. Support staff engagement in the Im implementation of evidence-based practice. Use best practice guidelines to inform care delivery. Monitor and evaluate the impact of the implementation of evidence-based practice. And reinvest all savings from improved outcomes into direct care. Recommendation eight, optimize digital health technologies to improve access, enhancing integration and support for person-centered care. Two actions are required to achieve this recommendation. Establish a standardized and shared system for collecting data and disseminating population health information and shared systems. Sorry, I'll repeat that. Establish standardized and shared systems for collecting data and disseminating population health information across the system. Develop and maintain a province-wide strategy to make electronic personal health records available to all Ontarians based on the principles of accessibility, security, comprehensiveness, patient control, and publicly funded and administered. Recommendation nine, maximize and enable the full scope of practice of all regulated health professionals. Three actions are required to achieve this recommendation. Implement legislative and regulatory changes to maximize appropriate and safe scope of regulated health professionals. The full scope of regulated health professionals. Remove organizational barriers that prevent regulated health professionals from working to their full legislated scope of practice. Provide resources to enable and regulate health professionals to enhance their individual knowledge, skills, judgment, and develop competencies to their full scope of practice. We have reached the end of our nine main recommendations. In the report, we not only define our objectives, but the date where we could all reach and move to transition and as is required to move the healthcare system from where it is right now to what is required. In order to move this fully transformed system from our current state, we will take some work which will be outlined in four comprehensive transition recommendations. They include one, include primary care in a leadership role in the process of transforming the health system. Use a funding model of the Ontario health teams that derives that drives them to realize the quadruplet aim of improved patient experience, improved patient outcomes, lower cost of care, 
and improve provider experience. Develop a single health system paid planner and funder that oversees and supports networks of local health teams, allowing for enhanced services and processes that realize the quadruplet aim. And four, align independent public health entities with the integrated health system while increasing the overall funding to public health. In this report, we detail substantive actions required for each of these four transition recommendations, which, will be, which we will not detail given the time constraint. We urge you to read the report, ECHO 3.0. I will now turn things back to Doris for concluding remarks. In 1867, yes, it's not a mistake, 1867, Florence Nightingale, which as Morgan said, today is 200 years of her birth, said, my views, you know, is that the ultimate destination is the nursing of the sick in their own homes. I look to the abolition of all hospitals and workhouse infirmaries, but it is no use to talk about the year 2000. Of course, Arineo is not advocating to abolish hospitals, so be assured and be, you know, not nervous about that. What we are though, emphatically urging and have been urging for the last 10 years is to recalibrate our heavy reliance in hospital care with the much and urgently needed balance approach that strengthens once and for all community care and anchors the system in primary care. We have said this over and over and over. There is no health system effectiveness anywhere in the world, my colleagues, that does not have strong community care and in fact, that is not anchored in primary care. As COVID-19 showed, this is not where we are today. Sadly, many primary care settings were closed and many didn't have the PPE to take care of patients. Sadly, nurses in home care more than once were turned away by patients because they didn't have PPE. Sadly, people cared in correctional facilities or people that experienced homelessness cared in shelters didn't have PPE either. Sadly, the tragedy in nursing homes is unimaginable. You heard us more than once saying that we abandoned seniors in nursing homes, not because the nursing homes and the retirement homes needed, wanted to abandon them, of course, but because we as a health system did. They were late in receiving PPEs. They have a staffing that is archaic, they have a funding model that necessitates urgent action. And even with the good health system reform that the government launched before COVID with Ontario health teams with our renewal support, even then we sidelined nursing homes and they were not mandatory in the OHDs. We need and we want different. And as we didn't rest before, because as Morgan, our president-elect said, we issue a report in 212, we issue a report in 214 that Dr. Hoskins, then Minister of Health said, inspired his own patient first report. This time, I have news for you with my board, my 44,000 members, our president, our board, our assembly, and in fact, every single Ontario. This time we ain't going to wait not even a year. So this is not a warning for any government. 
This is a warning for Ontarians in the day of Florence Nightingale 200 years birthday, that this time we commit to you. We are not going to wait even a month. We want to date the Minister of Health and the Minister of Long-Term Care, Minister Christine Elliott and Minister Fullerton. Number one, to commit that nursing homes and retirement homes, meaning long-term care, will be immediately part of all the OHTs. We want to hear that we are going to recalibrate to much stronger and robust community care. Nurses believe that the implementation of ECHO 3.0 is urgently needed to realize the health, the healthy Ontario that we all want to have, that we all aspire. Pre-COVID plans for health system restructuring in Ontario are compatible with our NEOS vision. So we are not saying throw away the model of Ontario health teams or Ontario health. We are saying recalibrate, speed it up, and let's work together so we have all health sectors, all health workers, all Ontarians at large with a strengthened health system for them. There is a crying need to enhance community care, and we must now take stock of lessons learned from the pandemic. Much to suffering, much to stress, much to work we all endure, and much to lives we all lost. Now is the time to move. We must seize the moment to build a stronger, healthy system for all who call Ontario home. So this is the system and how it looks. You heard from us what are the principles and you heard from us the recommendations and I'm going to move it now back to our president-elect for questions and the report is available, of course, now in our website. Morgan, back to you. The year 2020 with the beautiful picture of a painter, famous painter Banting in UK, that even a kid today prefers the hero nurse as opposed to any other of the previous heroes. I think Florence Nightingale would be very proud of what nurses are doing today and of how we're shining the future for Ontarians. Thank you, Doris and Angela. So I would now like to open it up for questions. We do have a couple of questions in the Q&A box already. So if you have any questions that you would like to ask about the ECHO 3.0 report, please type them into the Q&A box and we will answer them. So the first question is from Tim Lenardwich. So it's COVID-19 has presented a unique opportunity to maximize the use of virtual care in Ontario. How does ECHO 3.0 envision the ongoing rollout of virtual care? Should Ontarians expect to use virtual tours more often for interacting with their care providers? Well, it's fantastic that Tim actually asked this question. Tim actually, just so people know, worked with me on ECHO 1.0. Here you go, Tim. We are again with a much, much stronger model uh, given the learnings from COVID-19. Uh, virtual care is an absolute necessity, um, but virtual care should never replace also face-to-face -face care. So while we were already moving to virtual care and COVID-19, in fact, was a trigger to move even more, which is fantastic. We should continue. Here is what happens with, with, with COVID-19, the same as in our personal lives, in our working lives and in our health system lives. We should evaluate what we take forward. Virtual care is one of those aspects, Tim, and many home care agencies are ahead of the game on that. So primary care needs to come on that. Uh, but virtual care cannot serve people in the streets. Virtual care, uh, unless we give to people, and let me tell you, some, some countries are doing, and in fact, has done a lot of good in some countries to give gadgets 
to people that, that experience homelessness. Uh, so even then, I would say, we should explore those aspects of virtual care. Uh, nonetheless, that requires still a heavy investment, invested in investment, investments in community care overall, and in primary care in particular team. Thank you for that excellent question. And if there are any reporters or media outlets that have questions that they would like to ask, you're also welcome to enter those in the question and answer box. Um, so Susan McNeil has a question about, can you expand on recommendation number three, what you mean by patient enrollment? Hey, can you specify exactly which aspect? I can't, but hopefully Susan can. Susan, can you specifically speak about which aspect of recommendation three? Given that I don't have it in front of me. Go to the next question. We will, we will find the, the answer for her. Of, ah, here you go. Here you go. Interprofessional care teams, absolutely. So that the teams actually, uh, uh, much like, let me use a perfect example. Um, much like now in uh, nurse practitioner-led clinics and much like in community health centers, that the person enrolls to a team. Uh, we also in that recommendation are saying that we should not continue uh, approving solo practices. Uh, so that's, that's the approach that we are taking, uh, Susan, if that responds to your question. Yes. Kim Lenarch, which has a follow-up question, so, or a second question. So what health system measurement priorities does ECHO 3.0 envision for the rollout of Ontario health teams? What do you anticipate will be the greatest measurement opportunities? Um, the greatest measurement opportunity team, well, the first, the first priority in our view is to ensure that all sectors are included as mandatory in, in OHDs, right? Long-term care, for example, is the perfect example that was not even thought as part of, of the Ontario health teams. And that we recalibrate actually um, all sectors to receive the attention that is necessary. So a key measurement will be to see that people are receiving care where it's most appropriate for them. And let me apply to COVID-19 team. During COVID-19, there are some countries and some jurisdictions within countries that actually did not so good, like Spain, for example, the Balearic Islands in Spain. Their entire approach was primary care and home care. They didn't rely on hospital care. So they put all the focus of testing, self-isolation, um, of, of case and contact tracing, of monitoring after. They did that, they did that through uh, a model that involved public health, primary care, and home care together. And they then only really relied in hospital care for when it was absolutely essential. Uh, if you see what happened in our midst, right? Uh, we needed hospitals even to open opening the testing centers, right? We didn't even think about primary care or home care as possibilities. Some public health units did testing, some others didn't, right? It was done out of the hospital. So a, a measurement will be that the system is never overwhelmed because we are funding, we are conceptualizing, and we are using all sectors to their optimal potential. And therefore you can never really overwhelm one specific sector. Uh, what happened in COVID-19 is we prepare extremely when, well for the hospital sector. And we ended up with underutilization, which in fact is a good thing. It would have been terrible if we would have been overwhelmed. But it's not true to say that our health system was not overwhelmed during COVID-19. In fact, it was. The only sector that was not overwhelmed was the hospital sector. If you look at primary care, it was completely overwhelmed, so much so that some moved to virtual care, 
but others close their office. Uh, if you think about home care, same situation, not enough PPE, not enough staffing. If you look at nursing homes, let's not talk even about overwhelm, it was disastrous. So it, again, it's a story of two tales, both in terms of how well we did with the pandemic and how prepared we were and uh, how overwhelmed we were in the rest of the sector. Hence why enhancing community care, strengthening community care to have a robust community care sector and anchoring in primary care is the way to go, Tim. Linda Ward from CBC has a question. Can you elaborate on what the benefit would be of making long-term care homes part of OHTs? Um, the, the, the perhaps, thank you for the, for the fantastic question. Uh, the first answer that comes to mind very easily is that it would never have been forgotten, right? That um, knowing that most residents of nursing homes would not be able to access a ventilator, and even if they did, will not survive, even if they got a ventilator, but at the beginning we thought even there was not enough, right? And, and they were too compromised to go into a ventilator, but even if they did, then the first priority of the health system, and RNO call on that as the first priority, Linda, would have been to actually, um, afford the PPE necessary to nursing, to nursing homes first. They should have been the first that get the surgical masks. They should have been the first that get the testing. They should have been the first on the list to really ensure the only way to protect seniors in nursing homes and in retirement homes uh, was actually to keep COVID-19 out the door, not, not entering. The issue of one employer, right, would have been the first thing. If you look at what happened, all of those measures were put in place in hospitals. When RNO came out with the issue of universal masking, the first ones that took it on right away almost was the hospitals. When the issue of one employer, same. The issue of testing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it would have been a different reality for nursing homes and it's, it's, it's something that all will wear as a health system leaders uh, and it, it got to change. Thank you. Carrie has a question. Um, so the question is lo just looking for some clarity or clarification around independent practice for nurse practitioners and whether RNAO would advocate or approve independent practice for nurse practitioners? So we are advocating for everybody to interprofessional primary care. That is our recommendation three. It is no solo practices, no solo practices of physicians, meaning new physicians, no solo practices of, you know, nurse practitioners but models where you have professions working together, like in community health centers, like in nurse practitioner-led clinics. Those type of practices is well known, provide the expertise of all professionals to the benefit of patients. And at the center of ECHO, if you look on this green slide there, at the center of ECHO is the person. It's the person where there is a person in the community, whether it's a person that experiences homelessness, whether it's a resident in a nursing home, whether it's any of us going to our primary care provider. So we are actually advocating for interprofessional teams and not allowing, including new physicians to work solo. Thank you. Colleen has a couple of questions that tie in nicely together. So the first one is, does the plan include the primary care RNs and RPNs currently working in the family health teams across the province? And how will RNAO advocate for pay equity for RNs and RPNs working in the family health teams across Ontario? Beautiful. 
Well, I have better news than that. Um, first of all, the first answer is absolutely yes. RNs, RPNs, and nurse practitioners in primary care to their full scope and expanded scopes of practice. That's number one. Uh, and in terms of pay equity, uh, our idea that we are looking at is actually pay equity across all sectors, absolutely all sectors. Uh, harmonizing upwards the compensation of nurse practitioners to be the same regardless of the sector they're working, for RNs to be the same regardless of the sector they're working, for RPNs the same regardless of the sector they're working. Because if one thing, everybody woke up with COVID-19 is that every nurse, RNs, RPNs, and peace, and by the way, congratulations colleagues on especially today, Florence's birthday to all of us, is that nurses in every sector are important. You know, um, a nurse that works in an ICU doesn't have the expertise to work in a nursing home with, you know, people in nursing homes. A nurse in a nursing home cannot be just transported to an ICU. Every nurse in every sector is important and the same goes for home care, the same goes for primary care, and the same goes for, people in, for working with people in the streets of our communities, in a consumption and treatment services, Every single nurse, you know, my, my, my background and Morgan's background is rehabilitation. That's expertise. You cannot just be, you know, so every single nurse and therefore we are, we are going to be looking at pay equity for the different categories of nurses across all the sectors. And within that, of course, Morgan, across the different models, which was the original question within a sector. So whether it's family practice or whether it is um, a, in community health centers, that nurse, RN, RPN, or NP, needs to be earning the more, but moreover across all sectors also. Michelle from the Canadian Press Media Outlet has a question. Um, so are there international models you feel the Ontario government should be looking to for guidance? For instance, when you reference reimagining long-term care and modernizing homes for people living with dementia, where has that been implemented successfully? Yeah, uh, that has been implemented uh, right here at home, let me tell you first. Uh, so there are models in Europe uh, when we speak about the, the, congr the, the, the small congregates of seven people per home and um, and of course, it's not just one home, it's, sorry, it's separate homes, right? But then the RN rotates and visits. So you will have the unregulated care, the personal support working in each home of the seven people, and then an RN, an RPN, and a nurse practitioner available for the conglomerate of homes. That model already exists. And in fact, there is also one like that already here at home in BC. So we are not saying for everything in long-term care, it will be such a model, but for people with dementias, for people with Alzheimer's, that's the type of model. And then every one of these units of seven people, you try, you try to match the same type of people on past interest, because it's well known that that will drive more um, interaction amongst people with Alzheimer's and people with dementias and more quality of life if the person was an artist with people that have that type of interest or if people love to do uh, you know, gardening, that's where I would be. People with those interests are talking about Florence, they will put me with nurses to talk about Florence, uh, etc. And then on the broader way of nursing homes being seen as what what they are, the home of people, Michelle. Like we call them, we, call, we, we keep saying, and sometimes I think rhetorically, that this is the homes where people live, right? Well, if they're the homes where people live, then quite frankly, 
is no different than my home, your home, or, you know, so that means we need to treat them as community care, not as a siloed sector, which is what we have been doing. That was perhaps, Michelle, one of the most startling awakenings for me, myself, and for my president and Morgan, we were talking on our board, that we talk so much about nursing homes as aging in place, and they're the home of people, and let's, you know, be person-centered. And if it's the homes of people, it's part of community care, and hence, they must be part of Ontario Health Teams. So there are many models in Europe where that's already been, is happening, and there is uh, also models right here in, in BC. Uh, on the issue of the broader question, if I may, Michelle, of where have we seen it different in terms of dealing with COVID? Well, the Balearic Island, I, Islands, as I mentioned, did it completely different. Um, I spoke with the Minister of Health there. She is a fantastic uh, nurse, and maybe that has a lot to do with the approach that they took there. And let me tell you, this is not a tiny island. This is two point something million people. Um, she said as soon as she heard of the first case in Madrid, she was ready and she said to the team, okay, guys, we're ready to go. Primary care, home care, and, and in, in, in Spain in general, public health as a sector is part of primary care. They're, one of, they're kind of mixed together. And they put, um, uh, they put um, a squads of people that was a physician, a nurse, and a driver. And every time that was a person that had any symptom, they actually sent in all the communities, people to their home. So people were isolated right from the get-go, right? So then, of course, she never used the hospital system as much as otherwise, including, um, including the results that are fantastic and many people are talking about that. So Doris, this ties in nicely to Michelle's next question, which is about long-term care has been under the Ministry of Health umbrella before. Do you feel that COVID-19 pandemic would have unfolded the same way a few years ago or were the two sides still too siloed? It's too early to comment on the separation between Ministry of Health and, and into two ministries, Ministry of Health and, long, and Ministry of Long-Term Care versus Ministry of Health um, together. Uh, I do not think it would have been different in this case with COVID-19 because we have paid little to no attention. And I say it with with, with sadness, terrible sadness and heavy heart. Uh, for the last two decades, at least, to long-term care, uh, we have kept the same archaic funding formula that as Angela said, is based on complexity of clients, you know, uh, and does not account for quality care. In fact, when people do quality care, the next year their funding gets decreased because of the case mix index. Let me explain. We fund mainly now, mainly by case mix index. How complex is that resident? How many pressure, in, pressure source? How many falls? How many outburst behaviors, etc. RNO goes with the tremendous program that the ministry supports of evidence-based practices everything starts to improve, meaning the complexity goes down, and next year, funding goes out because that's the funding formula we have. What Angela was explaining on the recommendation related to long-term care, in addition to integrating that as a sector within Ontario Health Teams as mandatory, is that that funding must change. It needs to account for complexity of care, yes, of course, and also for quality outcomes. So if you decrease the complexity, but our outcomes are better, then you don't 
you don't give that money back or that money doesn't get decreased in your next year funding. The opposite, you keep that funding and reinvest not for shareholders, but for patient, for residents care, for more staffing, et cetera. The opportunity is there, and we have spoken about that with Minister Fullerton a couple of times. The opportunity is there because the Ontario Health Teams actually, the Ontario Health Teams have that um, a, a, a principle in their uh, contracts that if they save money because they're doing better care, better value, et cetera, that they keep the money, again, not for shareholders, but to reinvest on patient care and improving quality of care even further. Nursing homes, that's not the case. One more reason, Morgan, why to integrate Ontario Health Teams as a, a long-term care as a critical factor within Ontario Health Teams. So everybody has the same rules. The other piece that we have spoken both previously with all the ministers going back to, um, my gosh, to um, uh, Deb Matthews, to Eric Hoskins, to George Smitherman, to, I can name you so many, to Christine Elliott, and to Minister Fullerton, is the issue of staffing. And we saw what happened. We saw what happened. It was, it, it's tragic. It's not that nursing homes did, did badly, 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 because it's the fault of nursing homes. It's our fault as a health system. They have been short staffed forever. This is not new. One RN per shift, three RPNs. I mean, I don't need to tell you 9% of the staffing is registered nurses, 17% is registered practical nurses, and the remaining 75% is personal support workers whom we respect immensely. But the complexity in nursing homes and even in retirement homes is such today that that staffing cannot continue this way. We are asking at RNO for already many, many, many years, at least eight, that we need to have 20, minimum 20% 20 RNs 25% RPNs and no more than 55% personal support workers and one nurse practitioner for every 120 residents. This is the model across the entire province. It was in the Mind the Gap report. It was in ECHO 1, ECHO 2. It's now again there. And this is the model. And in addition of this called skill mix, we also need to incre increase the number of people, the, the, the number of people that work in nursing homes because it's, it's I'm sorry, it's brutal. It's brutal. And, and, and COVID-19 only, is perhaps as, as tragic as it is, the silver lining is that no one, no one ever before will be able to say we didn't know it. And the premier, committed to me personally that we will be involved in the restructuring of long-term care. And now I'm asking the Premier, we need to be in, involved as we have been, and even more so on the rethinking or pushing forward, speeding up the, the speed that we are moving with health reform in all sectors, integrating long-term care, Strengthening community care, we cannot repeat enough. Strengthening community care and anchoring the system in primary care. We have a system anchored now in hospital care. Number one, most people, as, a, as my president said, and we quoted her in the report, most people live at home, not in hospitals. In fact, we have, you know, and most people live at home, including nursing homes, the time to anchor the system in primary care is now because you ask Michelle from CP, ask what other systems are doing better than us? Those that anchor the system in primary care and have a strong community, community care sector. Thank you very much, Doris and Angela. We are at 11.02, so our 
Unfortunately, there are five questions remaining, but we are at time here. Do you have any closing remarks, Doris or Angela? Well, are those very long questions? Um, it, the questions themselves are not long. However, I think the answers... Um, we can do short answers. You are the okay. moderator. If you, um, if you want to go for it and you have time, um, then I think it would be... We'll start from the top and work our way down, see how far we can make it. Um, so the next one is from Monica, who says SARS was in 2003. How come in 2020 on this pandemic, we were not ready? It was a promise after SARS, if it ever happened again, we would be ready. So any kind of comments about what's different between SARS and COVID-19 or- well, I, will, I will comment very briefly and I will let Angela give also her perspective. Uh, you have the million question. You have the million question with one exception um, that this was way, way, way bigger than SARS, right? SARS was an epidemic, this is a pandemic. There is no country, no province, no health system that is pandemic ready. Yet, yet, we repeated some of the same mistakes, right? In SARS, in fact, we moved much faster with one employer, this time no. Um, and you know why it was no? Because of no PPE because of not enough sufficient people in nursing homes. If we had learned something, if we will fix one thing this time, which is to integrate long-term care into OHTs, strengthen home care, primary care, strengthen other congregate settings, like do more supportive housing so we have less people in shelters when they experience homelessness, do more um, consumption and treatment services so we have less people that are suffering alone. If we will strengthen community care and anchor the system in primary care, we will do better in next pandemics. If we don't, we are going to be in the same predicament as this time. Angela, your views. Well, I would like to add um, SARS, the virus that caused SARS was spread very differently, even though it was a respiratory disease. You know, in 48 hours, people know if you have the disease, but with COVID, there are people who are carriers and they don't show any signs and symptoms and yet they are infectious. And there are some things that were not known about COVID for a long time because it's transmitted like the distancing between individuals, the physical distances of two meters, but also it this, this COVID is showing itself in many different ways. It's affecting not only the brain and the, the lungs and, and the kidneys, it even affecting blood vessels. Some people are even getting cardiac arrest. Even children are getting the disease. Some weren't showing the symptoms. In the States, over four months, four weeks ago, my family who live in the States saying, lots of the children were carriers to their own parents who were in the school system because they weren't showing the virus the way we think it was going to be shown. Every age group gets this virus, but it affects because older people feel it more because of their immune status, which would be more, they're more prone, maybe have three or four different um, problems, chronic problems, so it lowers the immune system for them to fight this virus, but this virus could attack anybody. And there are lots of things that were not known about this COVID-19 that we're still learning about how it impacts people in different ways. Some of the signs and symptoms are varies, wherein in SARS, they are more consistent. Respiratory type system, your dry cough and your fever and so. Some people didn't have fever and they, got, and they, they, were, they had COVID, they were positive. So there are lots of things about different about COVID as opposed to SARS. So even the only ready, thing I would add to that is there are things we should have known, uh, absolutely. Uh, so I do want to put, uh, even though it's a very different virus, um, we started late in Ontario. It was, I, never, it was never low risk, never. Uh, and it didn't end up being low risk. So there are learnings we could have done, the PPE we could have done, the one employer we could have done. So let's hope this time we learn and we are ready for the next wave because likely it will come. Morgan. 
I agree with you, Doris, because uh, even in Trinidad and Tobago, they had early lockdown. They end up with 108 cases and five people died. Eight or five people died. Okay? I just checked in last week. They have one person remaining in hospital. A small country like that, they did the lockdown, they did the contact tracing, they did the isolation, and people obey the orders and they stay in their home. And they are the number one country in the world in how they dealt with COVID. So there are practices that we could learn from some other countries in the world and put into Canada to have a better outcome. Morgan. Thank you. Um, so we only have time for two more questions. So the next question is from Liz. And it's, does ECHO get agreement and support from other healthcare professional organizations? Yes, um, and the list is there. It's in the back. Not only this ECHO, also ECHO 1 and ECHO 2. Many, many organizations. Yes. Next. Thank you. There, so there's, the, there's still three more questions, um, but we do have That's to... That's why I'm trying to be concise. I know. Um, so there's been little evidence, this is from Janet, there's been little evidence of political awareness that those living in long-term care need specialized care in recent times. Do you think we have the political awareness now to improve the education, training, and staffing for those healthcare providers working in these environments? So I will turn the question upside down. I don't mind if there is awareness or not. We're not dropping this issue. That's it. That's it. Uh, ECHO 3.0 um, for us is the last call uh, to strengthen community care, which includes long-term care and to act. We have waited too long. Now it's time to move. Uh, we cannot afford not to, and the public is demanding that. And we are going to a partner with all political leaders, with all ministers, uh, Minister Fullerton, Minister Elliott, uh, any future ministers to get it right until we have a strong community sector inclusive of a strong long-term care sector, which is part of where people live and therefore is part of community care and that all of it is anchored in primary care that we continue to, of course, benefit from our hospitals, but as one sector, not as the center sector, because that's not healthy for Ontarians. Most Ontarians live at home. Um, can you provide some more information or some clarity around independent RNs who may be business owners and provide very specific services um, such as foot care and how they would be integrated into the OHT model or any evidence to support them not being integrated? Yeah, well, the, the ECHO relates to the publicly funded system, just so we are very clear. Uh, so we are looking at the whole system as a whole. So that will be for a separate discussion and probably contracting with Ontario Health Teams, right? There are many other, um, uh, first of all, I would love it. I would love it and Angela and all our board will love it if all of you actually were publicly funded because when people need food care, that's what they need. And guess what? Feet are part of our health. The same as teeth are part of our health. So at some point, hopefully, we will strengthen all of that too. ECHO at this point relates to the whole system, and we would love to have that conversation with you, so connect with us. Okay. There's one last question, which is also long-term care related. Um, so it is about the regulation or recognition of PSW so that they are recognized and may attract more to this desperately needed position and potential for future licensing or regulation, do you think that would help improve or make them a strong part of our system? Um, so it's about PSW regulation and whether that would help attract. Yeah. Uh, so we don't think at RNO that regulation of PSWs is where we need to go because PSWs don't have a unique body of knowledge. Being that said though, PSWs are critical to the health system both in nursing homes, in retirement homes, in people's homes, um, etc. So PSWs have a critical role. We are very um, supportive of PSWs. The question is when, what, and why, right? 
So the problem with nursing homes right now, let's start simple. We don't have enough of anything. We don't have enough PSWs. We don't have enough RNs. Don't have enough RPNs. And many of them don't have an NP period. So first we need to recalibrate what is it that we need in nursing homes. We're saying number one, a skill mix of 20% RN, 25% RPN, and about 55% uh, personal support workers, and then one nurse practitioner for every 120 residents. Then we need to look at more of all of these categories because the care that residents are receiving today is the best they can, but not, not what they need necessarily, not in good times and certainly not during COVID, right? Let's like just picture if the hospitals would have been staffed to the poorness that nursing homes are staffed. And we would have said to all the staff in nursing homes, you need to go to work in the hospital. Like no one would imagine that, right? Um, the time is, is ripe and the time is now. Remember, Minister Fullerton needs to put a report in the legislature on July 31st with the adequacy of regulated health professionals in nursing homes. So absolutely now is the time to push for the correct staffing skill mix and the correct uh, number of, st of staff and also the issue that someone brought before of the education, the ongoing education, the leadership support that they need, uh, the clinical support that they need, um, and, and of course also it goes together with the funding model that got to change to account for complexity and quality outcomes, not only complexity, and incentivize. Incentivize good health outcomes, right? Quality of life. That's all the questions that we have today. Um, so thank you everybody for joining us and for taking the time to attend the release of the ECHO 3.0 report. Any closing words, Doris or Angela? Fantastic questions. I just want to thank my colleagues and the numbers were huge, over a hundred people. So thank you all for attending. The report is posted now on the website. I want to acknowledge the absolutely tremendous work of my colleagues, um, Matthew Calway, uh, Director of uh, Policy at RNO that is now seconded to work with um, Inner Health City for a couple of months on the initiative led by um, a doctor, a, a, by, by Dr. Andrew uh, and a, of a Lee, a Chapman for people experiencing homelessness, Andrew Bond and Lee Chapman. And I want to thank, of course, all my colleagues in the policy department with whom we work so hard to put this report, uh, especially a, a big thank you to Brittany that worked with me and my colleague Irma Jean that came to fill in uh, once again for uh, Matthew, meanwhile that he seconded. And of course, Olga, uh, that did the, the, the beauty of the report. You will see how beautiful it is. Uh, thank you to Olga and to Madison that you will see her tweeting, to Sam that you will see his graphics. I am, it, it's just amazing the work of the team and to the board for reading the report again and again. And everybody, uh, guys, uh, fantastic work. And I just feel so proud to be a nurse and. What a day to release this report, Morgan. I can feel and see Florence looking at us all and saying, way to go, way to go RNO, way to go nurses, keep pushing because you need to get it right for the people that we serve. So that's, that's my ending remarks, thank you. Angela. Thank you very much for attending and we appreciate your questions. And for further detail, you have access now to the ECHO 3.0. And also, you could always contact us. We and, thank you, PG. and thank you, PG, for helping us today and for keeping me on the straight, PG. <laughs> have a great day. And we look forward to joining you on more activities from RNA throughout Nursing Week. Have a blessed week. Thank you. Everybody. Happy nursing week.
Uh, PG, can you leave only um, 